What is up, Instagram? It is yours truly. We are back for another edition of Ty's Take. Today, I'm your host, Tyler. This is the podcast where we talk about everything from entertainment to lifestyle to uh, opinionated stories and topics and stories that are impacting you and your community. So first of all, we do this each and every Friday. I'm so excited for today's show. We've got a lot of good topics as well as a special guest co-host joining us. Hey, Mindy is checking in. Hey, hey, happy Friday, happy Friday, and I'm going to go ahead and invite my co-host on. She just joined us. I'm so excited, super, super excited. Good morning, good morning. Let's go ahead and send the request, and let's get... Hey! Hi! Yes, how are you? Good morning. Well, Tyler, it's early, honey. It's early. <laughs> I tell you, when I tell you I was in my kitchen trying to put like this table bar, bar thing together, I went from like Hannah Montana, best of both worlds, to like Little Wayne. So it's been. <laughs> Yes, honey, we're, we're known as night walkers, not day walkers. So, you know, I was like getting up at six in the morning to get ready for you. And I was like, honey, this is homophobic. This is terrible. <laughs> this is an attack on my character during the daytime. Yes. <laughs> yes, you look good. Thank you so much for joining me as my guest co-host today. I don't know, this is Monique Madison, also known as Iona. Lots of cats. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> So thank you once again for joining us today. And I know it's early. It's early for me, too. I can't believe I, I, I picked 11 a.m. for these types of things. But um, <laughs> let's go ahead and tell a little bit about yourself. Um, and we'll dive into these topics a little later. Thanks so much, Ty. Well, my name is Monique Benison, a.k.a. I own a lots of cats, a.k.a. Miss Janet, if you're nasty. And I basically have been doing um, drag for about 25 years. I've been in the entertainment industry for a long time. And um, lately, my career has just been starting to really take off. And I just finished, you know, filming a movie. I'm currently working on a novel, which has just been amazing because it was picked up by a ghostwriter. So that was pretty incredible. And I'm also, you know, you can catch me multiple times a month at my home venue in Royal Oak, Michigan, known as 515, the home of Drag Queen Bingo and Detroit's number one drag show. Yes, yes. I love everybody over at 515. Um, yes. Can you share with us a little bit about what truly inspired you to begin your career in drag? I know it's been it's been several years, so you've seen you. I'm sure you've experienced a lot of different changes within the LGBTQ plus community. What really fueled that 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 spark, that passion for you? You know, I think it was coming from a small town. I'm from Sturgis, Michigan, where there was a lot of hate and a lot of discrimination. And when I moved out of my family's home at the age of 17, I moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan for a couple of years. And I uh, came across a small little dive bar called Brothers Beta Club. And I was, you know, 17 years old. They let me in. I sat at the bar to, you know, meet a couple daddies, get a couple drinks, maybe get my rent paid. You know, the things you need to do when you're a young gay and a beautiful drag queen walked up to me and she told me how stunning I was and I was like stop it and she was like you would be a fantastic drag queen and I was like you know I've never really had any kind of interest in that you know I've never really wanted to do drag and then she kind of explained what drag was to me that it wasn't just you know dancing on stage for dollar bills but it was actually a staple in the community for strength and for some reason when she had that conversation with me I've always had a leader style personality I'm a Leo if that tells you anything and I always wanted to make a change coming from such a small discriminative town so I thought what the hell you know and here I am 25 years later you know, I'm in movies and I'm writing a novel and I'm one of the, I guess you would say, well-known drag queens in Michigan. I travel all over performing all the time. I'm a hustler, baby. You know, it's what I do. Yes, yes, definitely that Detroit hustles harder aspect. Um, I can only imagine coming from like a small community and, you know, just being in the bar. We're all, I mean, I feel like we all have those stories of like being young and just like kind of trying to find ourselves in the process of being at these local venues. Um, what were some of the biggest challenges and obstacles that you faced and how did you overcome those? You know, I think probably one of the hardest obstacles I ever overcame was just pure hate. And I remember that I was 19 years old and I was finishing a show at Brothers Beta Club and we 
all got together afterwards and always went to Denny's just to kind of, you know, have that fun little sisterly hood time afterwards to discuss the show and the evening's events. And we opened the door to the bar to the parking lot and we were starting to get in our cars and a large pickup truck pulled up with um, eight men in it with baseball bats. And they just started bashing us and just started beating the cars, beating the people. Luckily, I was able to get away barely damaged, but one of my girlfriends, um, got hit in the mouth with a bat and it broke out all of her teeth. And uh, I got to, I actually lived above the bar. They provided apartments for the um, entertainers and I called the police and it took the Kalamazoo police 45 minutes to get there. And once they got there, one police car showed up and pretty much treated us like we deserved it. So I'd say that was one of the biggest obstacles to still feel that inspiration afterwards, knowing that most of the community Unfortunately, the straight community just didn't support us. Absolutely, and I appreciate you being so open and vulnerable and sharing that story. Um, you know, it's so important. I feel like there's so many topics that we experience, especially within our community, um, but even just in general in life that are overlooked. And, you know, those, those experiences make or break us sometimes. And, you know, that's something that you, you've, you've, you've had to carry with you, you know, up until today. And, throughout your life. So I, I really do appreciate that. And I feel like even now, you know, we, 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 we see it all the time on the news and, you know, long response teams, or long response times rather for police and just the way police treat people nowadays is unfortunate. You know, we, I, I definitely, you can speak from experience that we've come a long way, but you know, there's still so, so far to go. Um, changing topics a little bit, what in, who, who are some of your inspirations? Um, and it can be anywhere from people within the community or, you know, just everyday people. What, what, what truly inspires you? You know, I think my biggest inspiration in drag is a, um, a seasoned drag queen. She's a comedy queen. Her name is Coco Peru. And Coco Peru is what gave me my start because I was always under the impression that drag queens had to be dancers and gorgeous and hilarious and 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 funny and flexible and and all these things. And Coco Peru kind of showed me that, bitch, you ain't got to be able to have to dance. You know, you don't have to be able to do anything that you just have to be able to maintain an audience's attention by being charismatic, charming. I mean, funny, and most of all, appreciative, really living in the moment and realizing that these people are out there taking their time, their money to come see you at a local venue. And the, and, and the most important thing that you want to do is you want to show that appreciation. You want to make sure that whether the audience has five people or 300 people, that they all get the same quality of that show. And in the beginning, Tyler, there were audiences with four or five people. We passed around the same dollar bill to all of the entertainers. And now, you know, weekends at 515, I'm doing six sold out shows for 150 people each and 45 minute meet and greets afterwards. So it feels like not only has my career come a long way, but of course, the community as well. Absolutely. You know, you've, you've performed at several different venues. Um, what to you sets Michigan's drag scene apart from other places? Um, you know, do you want me to be honest about that, Ty, or do you want me to be politically correct? It's up to you. Which which choice would you like? I'm gonna say let's 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 do the honest answer because um, Ty's take is all about sharing your take and your perspective. You know, I think the Michigan drag community, I actually lived in Chicago for many, many years and then moved to Indianapolis and lived in many, year, many, many years and did drag there. And the thing that drives the Michigan drag community so much is competition. And I know that a lot of people think of that in a negative way. They're like, oh, the shade. Oh, you know, oh, no. Competition is what gives you that fire underneath to be better. And the girls in Michigan are incredible. I mean, you know, we've just got a girl from Grand Rapids that got on RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, we've got two girls that a couple of years ago did a um, uh, extra scene in a movie. We've got me that just filmed in A Holiday I Do, out Christmas 2022, and it was an incredible experience. We've got so much talent, but sometimes that gets in our own way with the competition. So would I like a little bit more sisterhood? Of course, but sisterhood don't pay the bills, honey. You know what I mean? I got to get them gigs and I got to get to them gigs. And so that competition, I think, just puts that fire under my ass to be able to, uh, you know, be as successful as I hope that people see me. Yes. Yes. Speaking of a holiday, I 
Um, I, I saw you. I was I was watching. I, I saw your pictures and like your behind the scenes, and I'm like, she's in my neighborhood. She's at. <laughs> I see you. I know that bar. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the film and what was what was that experience like for you being being a, being a star in this film? I mean, you know, I definitely wouldn't say a star. I wouldn't say that. I was cast in this film. I do have a smaller role, but it's a start. And um, it's really fun because I do open the movie. So I have a monologue and it's incredible. But um, you know what? I'm going to go with star because why the hell not, right? I mean, you know, let every star, every star shine bright in its own way. I'm going to say A Holiday I Do is an incredible movie that is so near and dear to me because it's got an entirely lgbtq cast it was filmed in michigan it is one of the only christmas stories that surrounds a gay plot line it was written by the amazing melinda bryce directed by the incredible paul schneider and the most important thing about a holiday i do is not only that it's being released christmas of 2022 is that we also are donating 10 percent of the proceeds of the movies uh, to of the movie to the trevor project because we want to make sure that we give back to a community that gives to us absolutely so where can people you said christmas so mm -hmm. you know, we, we got a little bit of ways but right, right. where will people do, do we know where people will be able to see the film? Well, we are doing a premiere in Detroit, which is going to be absolutely amazing. But we're making a huge announcement of what it's going to be released on coming up in a couple of months. So we want to make sure that everyone um, stays tuned because I think that they're going to be surprised what this film is going to be released on. So technically, we can't say anything le yet legally because of contracts. But when the announcement is made, I think everyone is going to be um, pretty surprised and pretty happy about it. I'm excited, so we'll be sure to share that news once the announcement is made here on Ty's Take, as well as, I know I'm about to be at this premiere, so. Exactly. Look your friends up. <laughs> yeah. um, we've got some big projects in the work, you and I both. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. But can you tell us a little bit about your entertainment company, The Cunty Kittens? Where's, where's this, where, where, how did these cats come into play is what I was <laughs> Well, it was in 2015, and I basically, you know, I'd been in the drag industry for a really long time, and I noticed that, you know, there wasn't a lot of girl groups. There wasn't a lot of uh, entertainers that were doing production numbers, and, you know, just there weren't a lot of comedy skits. There wasn't that Saturday Night Live feel. There was, it was just, I'm going to get on stage. I'm going to be pretty. I'm going to walk around in a gown. I'm going to collect my coins and I'm going to leave. And I wanted to do something a little different. So I got uh, four of my very good girlfriends and I said, you know what? I want to create an entertainment group, almost like Destiny's Child, honey, but you know, without the children, a little bit more man. And everybody was like, it won't work. Nobody will, you know, nobody will book a big group of girls because of the cost of it and I said you know honey nobody tells me no and when you tell me no all it does is just gives me that passion to go even harder and we started in 2016 and it is now 2022 and we are in 10 venues all over Michigan it has been such an incredible journey I have the most talented queens in Michigan in my girl group, the Cunty Kittens. I have Yolanda Del Fierce. I have Reba Rose Rao. I have Alexa Vogel. I have Velma Violet. I mean, it's like literally, I'm telling you, it's a sisterhood that cannot compete. And what I love more than anything is that being the first girl group in Michigan, it inspired other entertainers to create girl groups and do the same thing. So honey, you know, Imitation is the biggest form of flattery, but inspiration is something that you just take near and dear to your heart. Absolutely. Speaking of Yolanda Del Fierce, what is it like being two incredibly talented people? And, you know, like, does that ever get challenging at times? Uh, I can only imagine, like, you know, me and my partner, like, doing the exact same thing. Or does it just add to that passion and, like, even make it more exciting? You know, it's funny because we get that all the time because people think that we're really in competition with each other and there's no competition. Her lane is so different than my lane and she is so much better than me. 
She is. She is so incredible, so beautiful, so talented. I honestly think she's going to be on season 15 of RuPaul's Drag Race. She sews all my costumes. She does all my hair. She does everything for me to make me the best possible version of myself. And I do the same for her. The support is there and it is 100% authentic. A lot of people think because we are so open and transparent on social media that a lot of people are like your relationship your marriage cannot be that good and honey it's that great you are so fortunate when you get to not only marry your best friend but you have that support in your corner that somebody wants to succeed and will do anything for you when i was filming the movie she was there every step of the way touching up everything it was an extremely long day where she just stood on the sidelines and watched but there was not a moment that there wasn't a giant amount of pride in her eyes. And that's how I, I think that's how I've gotten to the level that I've gotten because without her support, I, I wouldn't be here. So amazing. Tears. <laughs> Emotions. <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> support as well. Okay. Especially right, exactly. That's so beautiful though. And that's that's so amazing. I'm I, I'm 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 so happy for you for for the two of you. It's beautiful, beautiful. Um, any advice that you would give to any like local up and coming queens or even people out there that may be struggling to you know accept themselves truly as who they are? Any any advice or inspiration you'd give to them? Yeah, I definitely would say, you know, be you, always be you, and you can never go wrong. And not everybody is going to love that flavor, but you have to realize that there are a lot of flavors in a bag of Skittles, honey. And it's, you know, some people don't like the green, some people don't like the red, you know, you've got to always be authentic to you. And if you are going to be in this industry, buck up because it is a hard industry to be in the entertainment industry. We are constantly told every single day how people really truly think about us feel about us it's almost like you know when you're working at a company and you get your 90-day review you know and, and you've got to sit down with your boss and they've got to tell you you know what how you have you know what you've done for the last 90 days that's good and bad it's the same in drag only it's every 30 minutes it's every time you're done with a number it's every time you're done hosting or doing a live on social media or a movie or a book anything people feel the need to tell you how they feel and honey when it's negative i live for it i love it i live it and every time somebody tells me something negative i respond the same thing copy and paste i say thank you so much for your feedback i'll take that into consideration have a great day absolutely absolutely you know especially people love to talk so um i've i myself got into some trouble when i was commenting on somebody's hosting skills um you know i just i just gave my input i i tried to compliment them and be like hey you're a really good host and it went it it went it went negative real quick i was i was getting death threats on, on social media and everything and i'm like girl <laughs> Oh. Calm down, calm down. Here's the thing. We've somehow gotten into a point in society where um, only one side of an opinion matters. There's no debate anymore. There's no, you know, your opinion doesn't matter, only myself. It's actually super disappointing and sometimes can be discouraging. But don't ever let your voice be silenced just because people feel the need to not want to hear what you have to say. Because if we all did that, how boring would this world be? You know what I mean? It's just, no, you be you, Ty. You know what? You know what you've got coming up. You know all the fabulous things you've done and are about ready to do. Speaking of, I'm so excited about our journey together. That's going to be a lot of good times. Oh, I know. I am so super excited. So I'll give you all the short version. I was in a virtual audience for the Nick Cannon show, his daytime show. Um, by the way, February 15th, you could catch me on the screen clapping in the audience virtually. But... <laughs> In March, actually, we're going to be joining each other along with Yolanda Del Fierce, and we are taking a trip to New York to be VIP the Cannon audience. So I wanted to make that announcement during our show today, but I am super excited. Um, March can't get here fast enough. This is going to be so incredible for both of our journeys. We're doing big things, got our hands in several different projects, and I am so, so, so excited. Like, it can't get here fast enough. I just ordered my luggage. Hey, yes, yes, clap emojis. Throw the clap emojis. I'm so 
this. So I want to thank both you and Yolanda for uh, joining me. We're going to have a good time. A lot of networking. Um, I don't I don't know if Nick Cannon is ready for all this because we're... <laughs> um, I also want to just uh, shout out to his staff, his team, and himself as well um, for not only having me on the show. I did a little, like, guess he was not wearing any pants. You have to watch the video if you haven't already, so I'm not giving away anything. But go ahead and check it out. It's on YouTube. It's on my social media. Um, but yeah, shout outs to everybody over there. Nick and Melissa and Joe. They're hooking us up. I'm so excited to actually meet them in person and just be a part of the show. He's so, like, if, if you've ever seen his show, he's so, like, inspiring and he tries to up people. So um, shout outs to them. That's happening. So we'll have a ton of pictures and videos. Uh, right here on Instagram. So New York, get ready for this. <laughs> here we come, baby. Here we come. Yes. Also, I want to announce before we dive into these topics uh, that Ty's take, um, we do our Instagram lives every Friday at 11 a.m. Uh, but we're going to be joining 9397 Network. We made the official announcement last week's show. But um, you can catch Ty's take today, premiering March 5th, every Saturday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and 3 p.m. Eastern. We're basically going to have an hour show where we take the topics that we discuss here weekly and we you know, ex ex explain them further and discuss them further as well as uh, different interviews with local talent and um, music artists. So it's gonna be a good time. And now I wanna know your thoughts. I just found this study uh, this week that says women say I love you 15 days after men. So with it being February, Valentine's Day is right around the corner. What do you think about this, about this study? You know, I think it's so interesting because I find that women are so much more emotional than men. And I feel, to be honest with you, sometimes um, it's overwhelming for men, you know, and then they pull back because they may be feeling the same way. But women have a, uh, a little bit more confidence with being vulnerable, while men have a tendency to want to feel that uh, strong, almost sometimes toxic masculinity. And they don't want to reveal how they really, you know, are feeling too quick because then they, they are, they're afraid they open themselves up. However, being a man that dresses as a woman, that has a little bit of slight feminine energy, honey, life is too short. It's too short, baby. You do not know if you are going to be here tomorrow. And if we've learned anything in this horrible pandemic is that tomorrow is not guaranteed. So baby, tell people how you feel about them. And if they don't want to hear it, at least you know you did what you did to let them know your true emotions. Absolutely. I, I mean, it's always it's always funny with these studies when it's like men do this or women do this or you know what I mean? Like, what if you identify somewhere in the middle? But right. um, I'm, I'm a cancer and cancers are extremely emotional, overly sensitive. And I used to think of it as like a, a bad characteristic, but now I just embrace it. I'm a I'm, I'm an emotional mess and it's OK to be that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, emotional mess. Hashtag emotional mess. Let's do it. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Love bombing. It refers to behavior patterns where at the beginning of the relationship, a partner showers the other, uh, the other person with over the top and uh, attention and affection. Um, I guess this is a new term. I've never heard of love, love bombing before, but apparently it's a thing. Okay. Um, love bombing. That. <laughs> That is, um, yeah, so for me, I think that that, if you don't mind me responding really quick, is that um, it's their love language. You know, there's so many different love languages out there, and there's so many amazing books. I recommend, seriously, doing your research of what your love language is. I, I read an incredible book that told me that my love language is actually labeled as a number two. And what that means is, is that I have got to show constant affection. I need constant affection. And the way that people can show me constant affection is by what they do for me. So you don't have to tell me that you love me, but you shoveling the walk for me so that I don't have to get up early in the morning and do it shows me that you love me. So for me, that constant um, confirmation of love is by, you know what, like, baby, I got up early and what I decided to do was run and get us coffee so that, you know, you could sleep in a little bit more. Bitch! <laughs> Yeah, that's all I need, honey. That's it. I'm good. There we go. You got me. Here we are. I'm married. <laughs> yes, like, that's, like, that's what it is. It's five more minutes. Can you? Can you? Can you? Uh, can you boil the water? <laughs> <laughs> can you 
problem. And then it turns to like, <laughs> that it's like iced coffee. <laughs> right. <laughs> Either works for me, baby. Whatever wakes me up in the morning. It's good. It's good. <laughs> so yeah, if you guys want to check out what, what Love Bombing is, we, we will post an in-depth version on sizetaketoday.com. I just, I, I felt for this show, I'm like, Valentine's Day, like, let's, let's, let's talk about love. Let's talk about relationships. Um, yes. Speaking of that, um, Market Watch is saying you need to skip the flowers and talk about money. So we need to talk about, even though it may not be igniting the spark, they're saying that retirement planning needs to be a conversation at some point. Um, so they're creating a plan to discuss your goals and monetary obligations and what you want to do in the future. So taking some time to like have that tough conversation and set up a game plan for later down the road. Um, I know it's not it's not sexy, but we can make it sexy. Honey, it's so sexy. Like literally, I am telling you, for one, I am a lady boy that does not enjoy flowers. I think it is a giant waste of money. You know, it's a it's a hundred dollars, hundred and fifty dollars for a bouquet that's alive for four, you know, four days, and then you throw it out and you're like, shit, that was, you know, 150 coins, you know? But you know, if that person that I, you're with enjoys that, I understand it. However, the sexiest thing for me is that when somebody is prepared for our future, when somebody is taking not just today, not just tomorrow, but thinking down the line for our life together, I'm 44 and being 44 is one of a conversation that me and my husband have daily because I want to make sure that we're taken care of for the rest of our life. You can take that $150 and throw it in an IRA, baby, and just give me the little receipt, put it in a card, put a kid's print on it, baby, and I'm good, you know, because that's what I need. That's what I want. I don't want for it to happen to be that I have all these lavish, gorgeous things and, th and then I ain't got no money in the bank in case of an emergency happened. This is one of my favorite stories. Can I tell you about it, Ty? Yes, tell me. Tell I tell me. you about a girl. I'm at a show at a little venue in uh, Grand Rapids, and we won't say what it is, but it's one of the. It's a very well known venue, and I've, I'm doing a show with a diva there, and she is a diva, and she is known, and she is fabulous, and she looks fantastic, and she's got some Louboutins on, girl. The most beautiful Louboutins, which we all know average between nine hundred and eighteen hundred dollars for heels. You buy them used on Etsy, still, girl. You got to pay seven hundred. This bitch looks gorgeous. Everything, Louboutin, 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 Gucci, Gucci, Gucci. We end the show. We pack up our stuff. We get ready to, to go home. She walks up to me and she says, girl, can you give me a ride home? Ooh, I, I'm sorry, honey, is your car in the shop? Oh, no, you ain't got no car? Oh, but you got Louboutins. Ooh. Bitch, no. Do not let your illusion cause you delusion. You need to put that money into the bank. You need to go to yourself, get yourself some comfort pluses from Pay Less Honey, and then you can get your car. It is so important that we make sure that our real lives are taken care of and that we have got stability before we start just, you know, it's those bitches that got, you know, a gorgeous Birkin bag and 30 cents in it. You just, you got to put the money in a good IRA. You got to invest money, stock, whatever you need to do. Do your 401k plan, whatever you need. But bitch, that's a perfect gift for me. <laughs> so, yes. so Ty, what I want for my yes. birthday? <laughs> yes. No flowers, no flowers, Ty. I just want a nice little receipt for the IRA. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, just some local headlines, really quickly. Um, the Detroit City Council is rolling out new guidelines for licensing recreational marijuana stores. So, just in case there is not enough dispensaries to choose from. Um, now we've got some guidelines that, uh, <laughs> more medical marijuana, more <laughs> marijuana is the takeaway from this story. Um, city council president, Mary Sheffield said it's about creating generational wealth, ownership, jobs for Detroiters and revenue for the city. So shout outs to Mary Sheffield's, uh, city council president and, uh, props to the city of Detroit for Hey, Sean's checking in. Hey, Monique. Hey, Sean. Hey, baby. Got to show some love to the comments. I know Andrew checking in and Mindy, just some of the people on here, sip and see, make sure we shout them out. Hey, hey, hey. Um, also, so I don't know if you've been to the grocery store lately, but I can never find any meat. I know, like, <laughs> this is crazy, but prices are going through the roof. 
Um, just with everything from like poultry to like pantry to everything in between. And, um, you know, I, I found it, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, so many people here in Detroit don't have transportation. Um, so getting to, you know, you think just running to the grocery store or, you know, walking to the grocery store, taking an Uber or a Lyft, you think yeah, it's not that challenging, but unfortunately it's, it's something that, especially in the neighborhoods here in the city that people, you know, people struggle with. And 39% of Detroiters are food insecure, which means that physical access, um, like I said, to, to, to grocery stores just isn't, isn't convenient for people. Um, and this article pointed out a crazy fact to me. There are more dollar stores in the city of Detroit than grocery stores. Wow. I mean, so. That's insane. And, you know, price the inflation. Like, I do all of my shopping um, through Shipped. And so I have it all delivered. So we all know that it's a little bit more expensive because, you know, they obviously have to make their coins to be, you know, delivering groceries. And I cannot believe the inflation, no pun intended, on me because it is so ridiculous. It's hard not to say inflation in me and laugh. But in seriousness, so what people are doing is, is, you know, they're going to, you know, Dollar Trees and all of these places and they're buying this unhealthy food because it's more affordable because they can't get that fresh product that they need at stores right now. I, I think it does have something to do with everything that's going on with shipping, with borders, with everything like that. But I know in Michigan, we have so many locally grown, like, um, you know, farm to table kind of establishments that where we get our meat from, you know, the farms and things like that. So I'll be honest, I'm a little confused on why there's a meat shortage because we in Michigan, not only flourish with water, but flourish with crop and flourish with um, livestock. So it's confusing to me. I think if you want my real tea, I think it's this thing that's been going on for two years with this pandemic of hoarding and, you know, just getting things, putting them in freezers, you know, holding on to them because everyone's convinced, you know, it's going to be the walking dead here in about a year. And so they want to make sure that, you know, they've got all their supplies. And I think it's creating a real shortage. Absolutely. And I mean, like I said earlier, like, you know, we mentioned, you know, bringing more dispensaries. But like we need we need more we need more neighborhood stores like I mean, you know, I, like big box stores are slowly coming into the city, which is fine if we're talking, you know, if we're talking downtown, if we're talking about like midtown here in Detroit. But I mean, really, these what about these families in, in, in the neighborhoods that don't get the hype, that don't get the whole Dan Gilbert bedrock like, you know, let's not be real. Come on. Like we need we need stores that people can access. You know, there's children buying buying dinner buying snacks at at the local gas station or the convenience store like i, I mean it just it, it just fuels me um really quickly also we want to mention that the saint patrick's day parade is coming back to court town so it's been on halt due to the pandemic so if you're looking to celebrate uh saint patty's day uh, my little leprechaun ginger <laughs> <laughs> Visit Detroit's, uh, Detroit's St. Patrick's Parade.com and then really quickly iHeartRadio, which is one of the major media stations across the U.S. They are relocating, so they're actually going to be bringing their um, cluster of Detroit radio stations from the suburbs, from Farmington Hills, over to the city. So I thought that was pretty dope, being somebody that's in TV and radio. Um, they're they're going to be coming to Eastern Market, so that's yeah, your morning shows like Mojo in the Morning and uh, Jay Towers, and um, I thought that was pretty cool. But getting, pretty cool. getting to the the, the gossip, um, so we all know that like if you follow Wendy Williams, she's been out for quite some time, and apparently, I think I think the Queen is uh, retiring her purple chair, if you will, in the hot topics. Um, so they've been doing like a lot of guest co-hosts with like Sherry Shepard and Leah Remini, Michelle Visage. Um, and apparently Leah Remini is really pissed off, um, because she, she said that, um, basically there were talks of her, you know, replacing Wendy at one point, you know, she was filling in and, uh, apparently they're going with Sherry Shepard. So Sherry Shepard has been announced the, the tournament, uh, guest co-host, if you will. But, uh, they're saying that it's, it's, it's going to transition over from the Wendy Williams show to the Sherry Shepard show. <laughs> Well, I mean, for me, I love Leah Remini. She's one of my favorite actresses from, you know, 
King of Queens, and I love all of her movies. I think she's a fabulous, giant personality. However, Sherry Shepard is as well. And for me, um, I think it's very important that people of color are represented correctly. And Wendy Williams has built a giant industry, a throne on that show. And to be honest with you, for me personally, I would much rather it be continued with a person of color because we have enough Caucasian people that are running the networks and running the, and I love me some Caucasian people, but I love me people of color as well. And right now, what I think is most important in this situation is that Wendy Williams, who built this industry, selects the person that she, as her protege, sees fit. And unfortunately, for Leah Remnant, I, I love her, but Sherry Shepard is what she's done, The View. She's done multiple hosting gigs. She's got the experience, honey, and the resume speaks for itself. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I love, like, like you said as well, I love Leah Remini. Um, I was actually tuning in because I love me some Michelle Massage. Um, yes. I, yes, Michelle, yes. <laughs> I'm so excited for um, when the tour comes this summer to DT, uh, to Pine Knob, Pine Knob, not DTE. <laughs> yeah. But um, I'm excited, I think, and I agree with you, I think representation, represent. Uh, get my words out. Representation matters, and I agree. I, I think you know, carrying on it being a person of color, I think is 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 the the smartest decision. And in the end, like you said, Sherry Shepard's got the experience. So, um, sending sending Wendy our best wishes of strength as always. Um, Pete Davidson, y'all know he's like you know mm, a thing with Kim Kardashian. Um, yes. Ed, during an interview with NBC L NBC LX, um, that he's leaving Staten Island, and people know um, if you if you're familiar with Pete Davidson at all, he's like the king of Staten Island. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, he is moving to Brooklyn. He said during an interview, um, basically saying, uh, "I apologize that my room is like a pigsty right now, but." I'm in the process of moving and people are saying he's saying he's moving to Brooklyn because it's uh, the drive, just like the commute is, is, is trash. Um, but people are saying that it's because he wants to be closer to Kim. Yeah. You know, I think it's a shocking couple combination that people aren't uh, quite wrapping their head around yet and you know i love all this tea i love all this drum i love being all mixed up to it i also think that these two individuals are geniuses at promotion and i think the tiniest little thing that they can do that keeps that name on every single clickbait that you see on social media or every article in that magazine or cover in the grocery store they know what to do i think this is complete and total promotion i think that sometimes in these uh, situations with Miss um, Kim, she creates a little bit more of a situation than what it really is. And we've seen in the past that it's bitter in the ass, you know, that it's sometimes we've, we've seen that it's actually been, you know, fraudulent. But with this one, I honestly believe that they are a couple. I think that they have found a connection. And I think that, um, I think uh, Pete, Pete done hit the uh, jackpot. That's what I think. Literally done hit the jackpot. He got him a good sugar mama. That's what he did. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> As like a candle with Kim <laughs> on it. She was like, let me, oh, let me grab my candle. Let me make sure there's no underwear around in the bedroom. <laughs> I was, yes, Pete. Um, also, a lot of people are talking about uh, this week. Um, apparently, like Nelly posted or allegedly it was leaked on his Nelly's Instagram story, a video of a female giving him oral. Um, <laughs> so just hours after that, Little Fizz, um, Little Fizz and Nelly both, um, they, I guess it was leaked, whatever, uh, whatever you want to believe. But um, footage for Isaiah Rashad, he basically was outed publicly, which I, I feel like this is, you know, uh, this is to me is, you know, you can't, it, it is never right to out somebody. Um, video was leaked of uh, Isaiah Rashad um, involved being a group of guys um, doing sexual things. And, you know, this to me is like, it brings up the like, where in your right mind do you think it's okay or appropriate to out somebody? 
You know, for me, uh, this, this is such a, um, it's such a fine line because, you know, uh, you've got to understand that, you know, I don't know how to say this correctly, but if you're going to put yourself in that situation to be videotaped, there has to be a part of you that understands it may be released. And for the outing process of it, of course, it's not correct. Of course, it's going to damage his career. Unfortunately, that's the world that we live in. Or like Kim K. I mean, it's a great way to, to throw you into a, I mean, what, she's a billionaire now, correct? I mean, like literally, sometimes when names aren't too much on people's lips, I think they can do situations to put them back in the headlines. However, the outing is unacceptable. But during the actual, we'll call it interaction, <laughs> that maybe when you see a phone, you stop and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, this is my private life. This is not something that I want put out there. This could possibly damage my career. I'm not blaming him, but I'm saying if you're going to make that bed, sometimes you got to lay in it. Like, if you're going to do those things and then it gets recorded, you know, now, did he get recorded? Does he know, Ty? Do you know if he knew he was being recorded? See, that's, I think that's, that's the line of where I'm at with this topic as well. I feel like there's people that are like OnlyFans or, you know, like they, people, that there are people out there that are totally okay with filming sexual activity. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the difference. If he did not know that he was being filmed, um, like you said, outing somebody is never okay. It's, it's mm -hmm. for stay you know is appropriate um and i think if you know you're being recorded then maybe you're just not thinking at the time but if you if you willingly are putting yourself into a position where you're being filmed and i mean people people are assholes and people will do whatever they want to do for that that quick attention um right. you put yourself in a situation to be filmed you should expect at some point that somebody may or may not leak that video. Um, exactly. I mean, you're going to put that evidence out there. That evidence will come most likely to the surface. And, and I just want to say something really quick about OnlyFans. Sex work is real work. And all of people out in the world that are judging people that are putting out videos and, and you know, doing OnlyFans and doing, you know, that kind of work frustrates me because literally it is – probably the world's oldest occupation if you do a little bit of research and then on top of that we should not be shaming people for wanting to video themselves in an intimate act it is their choice and if they want to do that it's happening all over the world how are we going to judge people just because they get videoed and then it gets put out there i can't stand that people do that because everybody that does that if you are coming so hard to judge these people for having these videos leaked and released and all of these kind of things maybe you got skeletons in your own closet you know what I mean? Like, everybody's got skeletons. So I don't understand why everyone is so upset about this. I was not personally upset at the videos. <laughs> I was not. Ah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, to be, to be completely transparent, I do not know if uh, Isaiah Rashad, if he knew or if he was aware that he was being filmed. Um, yeah. And I, uh, one person said on Twitter, my heart goes out to Isaiah Rashad. He has been through a lot these past few years. And the last things he need is an observed, um, an absurd invasion of privacy. No one deserves to be exposed against their wishes. And I think they put it, I, I completely agree with that Twitter user. Um, chiming in in the comments, Andrew said, it's really sad. A lot of his fans are turning on him too. A lot of people will be an issue. Yeah, it is really, really sad. And unfortunately, um, in, you know, the black community, for some reason, homosexuality is not celebrated. Um, it's a it's a known thing that it's not quite celebrated as much as it is in other communities. And it's disappointing because he's talented. He is an incredible, incredible entertainer and an incredible person. And the fact that this is going to affect his career is disappointing for me. I mean, we deal with this all the time, Ty. I mean, we deal with this being local personalities, me and you, that we know that we get discrimination against us all the time. We see it in the comments. We see it in, you know, under pictures. We see it. And it fuels us because we're used to it. 
but he's not. And then on top of it, to be outed without permission, honey, all I have to say is lawsuit, lawsuit. So whoever decided to do that needs to pay the price for it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, with these types of topics, we do like to share all of the sides of, you know, people involved. So I do want to say that Rashad has yet to address the situation publicly. Um, however, Nelly, with Nelly's situation, he did issue an apology for the video that was posted mistakenly on Tuesday. Nelly told TMZ, I sincerely apologize to the young lady and her family. This is unwanted publicity for her and them. This was an old video that was private and never meant to go public. So that, that's, that's what Nelly's saying. Um, we'll leave everybody's opinion to themselves. If you believe that it was purposely posted, then um, maybe, uh, maybe some trouble, maybe some lawsuits to come. Um, <laughs> moving on. Uh, 50 Cent is reacting to the Biden administration handing out crack pipes. Um, uh, shared his thoughts on Instagram. There was this article that was very misleading, stating that stating that um, Joe Biden's administration would fund an initiative that would hand out crack pipes to addicts in an effort to improve racial equity. Um, but diving deeper into this story, um, there's a fact checking website. They, um, they came out stating that the story was mostly false. Um, the claim originated from the 2022 harm reduction Program grant, which was issued by the substance abuse and mental health services administration. Um, the documents that safe smoking kits would be purchased as part of an effort to reduce harm to those that are currently battling substance abuse and drug addiction. Yeah, yikes, just yikes. Just this whole thing is just, um, to me, this feels like a smear campaign. I feel like this is something to target a man who is 100% an ally to multiple communities. And I think that this story is completely fraudulent. I think that there is no way that he would hand out drug paraphernalia that is not legal to a specific community in such a disgusting stereotype. I mean, it's so frustrating. And I honestly think that there is no like validity to this story. I think that this is somebody, you know what I'm saying? Like literally on the opposite side of Joe Biden, because people aren't happy with what he's doing to try to somehow turn a community that supports him against him. It's ridiculous. Nobody would do that. I mean, I don't mean to be angry, but come on. I mean, like, are we are we really doing this? And then just to affiliate that disgusting drug and that paraphernalia with such an incredible community is ridiculous. That community has had multiple, multiple, wonderful, tons of success, tons of fabulous things. And we are going back to racist, disgusting hate and stereotypes of some, I, I just, I, as you can see, I'm burning, I'm burning, I'm burning up, I'm burning. <laughs> it's a UTI, I'm burning, I'm burning. It's a bit, it's, I'm done. I'm I, angry about it. Uh, Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn commented on the, on, on the story saying that uh, she basically, like I said, accused the Biden administration of funding drug use. Um, a statement from the Health and Human Services, they said HHS and ONDCP are focused on using our resources smartly to reduce harm and save lives. Accordingly, no federal funding will be used directly or through subsequent reimbursement of grantees to put pipes in safe smoking kits. So I think the whole, whoever, whoever is originally behind blasting this story, um, that is, it, it's a smear tactic. Um, it's so it's so smear. It's so gross. I'm sorry. I do not mean to be so angry, but it's so frustrating. I mean, can't we just next? I'm done. <laughs> next, next, next. Uh, oh, there's this article that says that RuPaul's Drag Race is mimicking Marvel's superhero kind of formula. Um, basically, Drag Race UK. Uh, is um, they're, they're doing something different. They're changing it up. I, honestly, even if like with, with, with this current season, which airs later on tonight, um, you know, they're changing it up with the whole like chocolate bar and bringing girls back, you know? Um, so they are going to be bringing contestants from all over the world, um, including like, uh, just to name a few, Bag of Chips, um, Cheryl Hole, Mo Hart, 
and Dina Steels. And I wanted to know, like, what are your thoughts on the whole franchise? Honestly, I watched the show, um, but I am so kind of like, I'm, I'm RuPaul burned out. And now I know saying this, I, I know people are about to be <laughs> going in on me, but I'm, I'm tired of RuPaul. I watch, I watch for Michelle Visage. <laughs> you know, I've been really fortunate that I have worked with many, many girls from this franchise, many girls, all incredible. I am currently watching UK versus the world. Um, it's on WoW Plus, and uh, that's an app that you can get, you know, on your phone that basically is literally a ton of amazing gay content is on there but it is a giant kind of rupaul every show and all of the queens from rupaul doing shows um for me i um you know it's been 14 seasons you know uh, um my personal opinion is the best seasons were the first six seasons uh it was when it was more realistic more vulnerable more we got to see growth in people um everybody now that is put on to RuPaul's Drag Race, you know, they have to have 100,000 followers on social media and they're pre-selected. With the current UK versus the world bringing back Juju B for the fourth time, fourth time, this last elimination, if you have seen the show, um, it's getting to the point where it's feeling no longer like a reality competition show, that it's, you know, starting to feel a little bit staged. People are getting frustrated, but... I felt like RuPaul wanted to mix it up because it's such an important show to be on. It really is for our community, Ty. Even though we get frustrated with it, it is so important that we have representation on the screen. That is why I did this movie. That is why we're doing this show. That is why we want to make sure that the LGBTQ plus community is represented for all of the little, you know, gabies out there to be able to see themselves. And I am a fan of RuPaul for many, many years. Um, I do think it's a little saturated. However, I will celebrate anything that brings attention to our community in a positive way. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think what's crazy to me is, yeah, no, by no means, I Ru, Ru has done some amazing things, uh, you know, so accolades, and I, I'm giving you your flowers. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I want to be clear on my opinion before <laughs> I get back last, as soon as this live ends. But like, like, like you had mentioned, I think, and you know, uh, Andrew said in the comments, it's very produced. Um, so I produced, think, produced. <laughs> Sorry. I think that it's, you know, it's, it's like you said, the earlier seasons, um, I think, you know, yes. But then now it's kind of just like, it's, it's predictable. Um, and then like, even to the point where like, we just 14 seasons in and we, and we just had somebody from Michigan, mm -hmm. like shout out to Orion. Like, we're, 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 uh, why did it take so long? You know, what's so funny to me is a lot of people say that. They say that we just had somebody from Michigan. And shout out to Orion. I've done a couple of shows with Orion. She's a sister of mine. She does a lot of my wigs, to be honest. She's a really talented wig artist. And um, we actually have had multiple people from Michigan. Dita Ritz was from Michigan. Ivy Winters was from Michigan. But the thing was, is when they were cast on the show, they were living in a larger city, but they originate. I believe Ivy Winters lives in Battle Creek currently. And I know Aiden Zane, who was on the show, lives in Lansing. She actually, her family attended one of my shows in Royal Oak, and they put her on FaceTime so she could see the show because she was so sweet. She didn't want to come and drag and take away from the attention of the show. But they all wore Aiden Zane shirts, and it was amazing. So also Saint from Dragula is uh, from Michigan. So for me, um, there's been many people, but I think that they wanted to further themselves by saying, you know, I'm from Chicago when, you know, Dita Ritz was, you know, originally from Lansing, things like that. So it's amazing to me that uh, people are claiming she's the first one. But to be honest, I think she's the first one that currently resides. So I think, you know what I mean? It's that fine line. Michigan's been represented, but never proudly. Nobody was ever like, well, bitch, I'm from Michigan. You know, nobody ever did that. You know, and Orion, God bless her for the first time, was like, I am from Grand Rapids, Michigan, because Michigan has incredible talent. And I'm going to say something. Miss Orion, <clears throat> story, is a talented, beautiful person that is an incredible entertainer. And I have seen a lot of opinions from people all over Michigan saying, oh, Michigan has all these incredible entertainers and this is the best that RuPaul Drag Race could do. I just want to put a little quote out there. 
a little quote just real quick. Then audition. Audition. If you're fantastic, audition. At the end of the day, RuPaul chose who she wanted to choose. And Orion has represented us proudly. Proudly. And if you don't like what she did, honey, then you go ahead. You get yourself 14 outfits. You do your photo shoot. You make your videos. And you audition. Because if you weren't selected, sorry about it. Get That's right. the way it is. Life away. <laughs> yeah, there you go. She, I am so proud of her. She's been doing drag like three years. And she's her whole life has changed. She just got back from London. London, honey. London. Doing a show. Don't be hate. Just celebrate. You know what I mean? Just celebrate. It brought Michigan attention. Absolutely. And that's what we need. Like you said, it comes back to representing us. So that's, I mean, if, if you got an opinion, do it better. Right. Try Get it. your own show. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> that, I can't believe that's the end of our show. I want mm. always for getting up super early because, you know, us late hours, this is, this is early. This is like 6 a.m. Like, <laughs> this is 6 a.m. I was up at 6 a.m. to get ready. Yes, I was. <laughs> so, before, before we go, I do want to thank you so much for joining me. You're always welcome to guest co-host. I am excited for New York. This is about to be so exciting. So if you're watching the live and you don't follow Ty's Take Podcast, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook because we're going to have some behind-the-scenes pictures and videos um, from our upcoming trip to New York. We're going to see Nick Cannon. Nick, get ready. Drag fabulous fabulousness and um before we go let everybody know where and how they can catch you at 515 in royal oak yes you can catch me at 515 in royal oak i'm there every last weekend of every month doing drag queen bingo and i am there the first and third sunday of every month doing our a drag queen brunch a cookout we've got an amazing show coming up february 20th where we have the amazing willow pill from season 14 of rupaul's drag race as our special guest the first show is sold out we do have a handful of tickets left for the second show so make sure to go to 515.net to get your ticket and come see miss monique madison aka i own a lots of cats AKA Miss Jackson, if you're nasty in, in real time, real life. <laughs> yes, yes. I'll be actually seeing you on, I think I'm, we're going to the first show. So, um, oh, wonderful. We're, um, we're excited. So it's going to be a good time. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining me today on today's show. I hope everybody watching enjoyed the show. Um, we'll post your social media in the description of the live. Watch back and follow you. Um, be sure to catch uh, Monique Madison. I own a lots of cats. Girl, you got more names. You got more names. I don't know. Um, uh, but yes, we'll post all your socials in the description as well and on our store. I hope you have a great rest of your Friday. Get some rest, and we'll talk soon. I'm excited for New York. Me too. Bye, everybody. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. For Bye. Me. Be sure to follow um, us on all social media platforms as well as 9397 Network. We're premiering Ty's Tape today on the radio on Saturday, March 5th. So be sure to follow the page. There's a lot going on. But I hope you all have a great weekend.